Tonight on NJTV News, thousands hit reopened beaches, state parks, and recreational areas on this holiday, hours after the state government shutdown comes to an end. How lawmakers and the governor reached a deal. Parades, parties, and patriotic displays in towns across America to celebrate a nation 241 years old. Patterson, America's first planned industrial city, marks an anniversary more than two centuries in the making. A new exhibit to honor what we gobble up more on July 4th than any other day, the hot dog. And what the Jersey Shore has in store for us this summer, we get some intel on the best beaches to visit. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Hill. Mary Alice Williams is off. It looks like any other July 4th holiday at state beaches and parks reopened hours after the state government shutdown ended overnight. All of the parties saying they wish they had done last week what they rushed through on Monday when the battle took a different turn. That's when Horizons CEO Bob Marino went to the Capitol for negotiations. Marino is an NJTV trustee and Horizon is a funder of NJTV News. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron on how it all unfolded and what it means going forward. A roar went up in the assembly around midnight last night when Speaker Vincent Prieto entered the chamber. When the budget bill passed a few minutes later, 53 to 23, there were more kudos for the speaker. This body salutes you today. Members, please rise. For weeks, the Democratic speaker had been under pressure to make a deal with the Republican governor and the Democratic Senate president, pass a bill restructuring Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and the governor will sign our budget bill, the Senate president told Prieto. But Prieto didn't like the Horizon bill and was stubbornly refusing to consider it. When no budget was passed by June 30th at midnight, the state shut down and the finger pointing began. Things were at a logjam for three days until Horizon CEO Bob Marino showed up at the State House and met with both legislative leaders. I think you all realize that Horizon didn't ask to be in the middle of this situation, but I do appreciate the opportunity to have met with them and express my concerns. Seven hours later, at 10 o'clock last night, Senate President Sweeney and the Speaker held a joint news conference to announce the deal. None of this was easy. But the speaker says he's always willing to compromise, and it, that is a true statement. And again, I want to thank you. Thank you. And I think this is a good day because everything will be open probably starting tomorrow. I think the governor said he's putting out a release that the beaches will be open tomorrow and the parks. So, speaker, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator President, and I appreciate. And, um, you know, we were in a crisis. And uh, again, uh, for me, it was about getting this budget passed. And I still stand behind. It was a, a good budget. Prieto had not wanted to rush a Horizon bill and now had to explain his change of heart on that. The one thing that I had said, I did not want to see a bill move before it was properly vetted. The difference, since we were in a crisis, we brought in the key stakeholder, as I said, the entity that's going to be affected by this, had them be part of this discussion, and I talked to a lot of other key stakeholders. With Horizon solved, all parties would agree to 73 additional items in the budget that Democrats put in there. By us accomplishing this, and we're going to stay here tonight, uh, whatever, 12, 1 in the morning, whatever it is, uh, everyone will be able to enjoy their Fourth of July plans as, as is. I'm sorry for the inconvenience you know, uh, that everyone went through. But at the end of the day, we have one hell of a budget that we can be proud of. The lesson in this episode, Sweeney said, is always talk. I knew we could get to a conclusion if we could get in a room. I had reached out to Bob Marino on Tuesday and asked him to give me a call, and I couldn't get him to give me a call. And it was frustrating because you could see things coming. And for the first time since I've been Senate president, I knew we were in, we were in trouble because when people don't talk, things don't get done. 
Next, it was Christie's turn. At 11 last night, he came out to confirm that he was signing off on everything. Finally tonight, I'm very pleased that both the Speaker and the Senate President have reached an agreement which will result in the legislature fulfilling their obligation to deliver a budget to the governor. I'm sad that it's three days late, but I'll sign the budget tonight. He had gotten a horizon bill. Well, not all that I sought when I laid out my, cons my concerns in my February budget speech are there. That's the nature of compromise. And he gloated at having forced the assembly speaker to blink. For the last two weeks, I was told that no bill on horizon would be passed now, that reform had to wait. That was unacceptable to me. And despite the doubts of some folks, tonight we've achieved the results I asked for in February. But Christie had wanted millions of dollars from Horizon's reserve funds for the state, and he didn't get that. We have finally capped the excess profits of Horizon. And we're ensuring now that the Horizon excess profits are returned directly to the policyholders. Nonetheless, he claimed victory. Those who said as late as Friday that they would not even discuss a Horizon bill have now been proven wrong. After Christie spoke, the assembly went to work, passing the budget bill and then the horizon bill. Lawmakers frustrated during the shutdown savored the moment. It was definitely worth the wait and it was worth the fight. Um, you know, I think a lot of people sitting here uh, thought that the governor wouldn't live up to his word and would cut the programs. Um, it's why it was, it's always beneficial to come to the table, work together, work across the line. I'm just happy. There's no reason to shut down government over a bill or over an issue. There's always middle ground. And I do have to thank the speaker now because he at some point decided to see middle ground and that wasn't easy for him, but he did it. Over in the Senate, they reversed the order, passing the Horizon Bill first, 33 to 1, and then the budget on a party line vote of 21 to 14. It's been a long day, um, it's been a long weekend. Uh, it's a shame it ever came to this. It didn't have to come to this. Um, I think it's probably the best budget that uh, I've chairman that I've seen in the last eight years. Uh, there's a lot of priorities in this budget, and I'm glad the Senate stuck together. I think the legislature should have come to a solution long before now. And it's a shame that the people in New Jersey were impacted by this. It should have never happened. I mean, the people have a right to be angry. You know, I would be angry as well. I mean, we have a responsibility to get the budget on time. Uh, nevertheless, it's better to get it done now than not. So we're going to move forward and uh, hopefully this doesn't happen ever again. It was an epic fight, this budget battle of 2017. Students of New Jersey politics will be replaying it and discussing it for years to come. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. The shutdown shuttles the show that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Jersey City. Mayor Steve Phillip has moved the fireworks show from Liberty State Park to its change place. He did so because he says he could not rely on the state ending the government shutdown, which shuttered state parks and more. The shutdown ended after midnight, and even though all the parties have been in agreement late yesterday, Phillip says it was too late to risk a last-minute setback keeping Liberty State Park closed. The Jersey City July 4th celebration includes a whole lot more than just fireworks at 925. Jersey City's own Cool and the Gang takes the stage at 8 o'clock. Next to West Orange, when you can't make it to Washington and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, sometimes it'll come to you, to your town. At least a replica of it, a traveling one. About six feet tall and nearly a football field long. For the Independence Day holiday weekend, it was staged on the football field at West Orange High School to honor those who made the sacrifice and pay homage to those who never made it back from the war. Even relatives who had visited the one in D.C. came out to find a soldier's name and to pay their respects. Finally to Montville. What a feat for Renee Robtar, who's finished the Boston Marathon not once, not twice, but how about 11 times? Today was a much different competition for the 58-year-old school's superintendent in Morris County. She was on the stage for Nathan's famous 4th of July International Hot Dog Eating Contest, up there with the lights of Joey Chestnut. Rotar chopped down eight dogs in 10 minutes, well behind the winners for men and women, but she fulfilled a longtime dream. And that's our Garden State Express for this July 4th, 2017. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off.
On July 4th, you can find parades all across the country. Mothers, fathers, children waving and wearing red, white, and blue to honor and celebrate America's independence. There are huge events, especially in small towns. Lauren Wankel captioned one in Ocean Grove. Proud Americans line Main Avenue to watch the annual Ocean Grove Independence Day Parade. They wave flags as patriotic songs echo through the streets. To the prairies, to the ocean. There's a big celebration in this small seaside community. I think we all just had to take a step back and remember where we live, the values that we have, the freedom that we have, and just be able to sit side by side on the street in a beach chair and watch a parade go by. We actually established the parade 48 years ago at the 100th anniversary of the founding of Ocean Grove. The parade is sponsored by the Ocean Grove Camp Meeting Association with help from some local businesses. There are about 90 different groups who participate, including law enforcement and public safety teams, bands, politicians and more. It's a time not just for this community, which is part of Neptune Township, but also for surrounding communities to unite and share their love for our country. I'm just proud to be an American. We can be amongst the kindest people in the world even though there are times when we don't reflect our best side. Ginny Radford has dual citizenship. She was born in England. You live here, you need to support the country that you live in. It's a wonderful country. I think it's the land of the free and we're seeing more and more countries which are not free. I think we need to be grateful for where we are. Radford is one of many who crowds the streets looking to take in all the sights and sounds. <laughs> The onlookers' cheers excite the already excited parade participants. It's amazing how many people, when you ride in the parade, I've ridden the last few years, to see how many people are standing on the side just to watch and the smiling faces. Oh, it's a pump of adrenaline. I mean, you know, here in Ocean Grove, freedom and liberty and, and providence and patriotism all go hand in hand. And so there's this, this long-standing enthusiasm where we just hail this grand national holiday with grace and with enthusiasm and zeal. Bagpipers entertain the crowd and bright red vintage fire trucks glisten under the summer sun. The parents love it more than anything. They, they see enough of the new ones, they don't see these old vintage trucks, the 30s and 20s. The parade coordinator has been planning this event for a few months now. Months of work for a parade that lasts about an hour or so. Still, the participants behind me are thrilled and grateful for the experience. And even though there's no rehearsal, they don't need one because most of these groups come back year after year. But everybody wants to be in the parade. And if they're not in the parade, they're on the sidelines and they're waving flags and they're participating that way. It's just part of Americana. It's, it's, it is an amazing thing that we're able to have this opportunity to get together, bring groups from all over together uh, and, and just celebrate the, the birth of our nation. God bless America. This parade is a reminder of how proud people are to call themselves American. God bless America. In Ocean Grove, I'm Lauren Wonko in JTD News. It's the staple of cookouts on Independence Day, hot dogs. By one count, Americans consume 150 million hot dogs on July 4th alone. It's also National Hot Dog Month, and Ellis Island Museum is marking it with a new exhibit, the history of the hot dog. Brianna Venosi has the sizzling details. Hi, folks. Can you think of a more beloved American food on a sunny summer day? They're hot, they're tasty, and they make for that oh-so-perfect bite. It turns out the origins of the hot dog are woven into the fabric of American immigration history. Pretty profound for the snack that goes best with picnics and cold beer. We've made the story of the hot dog, which everybody takes for granted, but it's so much fun. Uh, we've made it into an immigration story because that's really what it is. The stories of five iconic hot dog purveyors are on display at Ellis Island Museum just in time for National Hot Dog Month, each tied by a common thread. The founders immigrated through Ellis Island. And on this opening day, hundreds of free samples are being cooked up for visitors to celebrate. So we have five different companies. We have, um, we have Sabret, we have Hebrew National, we have Nathan's. We have Vienna beef. 
Vienna Beef, one of the oldest brands, started in 1893. The gentleman wound up in Chicago selling hot dogs, or whatever they were called then, uh, at the World's Fair, saved enough money to buy a storefront, and there's Vienna Beef was born. Then, of course, there's Walters. The recipe for these dogs came from Italian immigrants. Walters is from Maranek, New York, family, fourth generation family business, and uh, great hot dogs. It turns out the all-American hot dog is anything but. Nathan's has been around for over 100 years with Polish roots, and I got to tell you, it makes for a pretty good breakfast. I like that when you go around, they have like the different flags from the different countries, yeah, so it's really interesting to see. <laughs> Getting a taste of the cultural influence makes for a better history lesson. At Sabret, you can find the name of one of the original owners, Christopher Papalexis from Greece, in the Ellis Island passenger log. The spice is still the same as it was from 90 years ago, just a little alteration. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of European influence. Anything that you can um, relate back to the immigrant experience is exactly what um, young people and old people and middle-aged people need to know today. Here's a shocker. Get ready for it because I didn't see it coming. Turns out mustard is the sole and original condiment meant for the hot dog. There's a book called Never Put Ketchup on a Hot Dog, and I thought that was interesting because I always thought it was just my husband telling me never to put ketchup on a hot dog. And I'm from Iowa, so we put ketchup on hot dogs. <laughs> put ketchup on everything. Right, exactly. <laughs> the free franks are for opening day only, but the exhibit stays up through July, and I can't file this report without using at least one corny pun. So after learning the roots of this oft underplayed food, it's good to see every dog does have its day. On Ellis Island, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Another celebration more than two centuries in the making, Patterson, once an industrial icon in America, is turning 225 years old. Andrew Schmertz has the story. Alexander Hamilton himself took time on the 4th of July to celebrate the birth of the city he founded. He told the story of how he came to Patterson during the Revolutionary War. In the aftermath of the Battle of Monmouth, we found ourselves, the army, on our way to Paramus. And we took a small stop here at these great falls. The celebrations for the 225th anniversary were upbeat. Stories of how Patterson was founded as the nation's first manufacturing hub, building the locomotives, creating hydropower from the Great Falls, and being a key player in the aviation and firearms industry. Well, I think it's a very special, obviously. Uh, how many municipalities can boast 225 years and have accomplished what those Pattersonians did throughout those years, where industry was born, where dramatic changes took place in America. The focus today was on Patterson's early history, less so its recent history. This is a city known for its crime and poverty, and now a mayor who's under indictment. But the message today was about optimism for the future. As we reflected on Patterson's history and we learned about all the challenges that this city has overcome, from fires to floods to so many natural disasters and other things, we really realize that even though the Patterson of today has many challenges, that our past has shown that the people of Patterson can overcome tremendous challenges. Like other industrial cities, Patterson never recovered from the move away from the manufacturing economy. Today, the Census Bureau reports the poverty rate at 30 percent. Leonard Zacks helped write the law naming Great Falls a national park in 2009. It's landscape. We got one. It's history. We got one. It's people. Uh, we have this kind of vibrant life of the city. It's cultures, it's cuisines, uh, it's architecture, it's, your, it's buildings. And that's what the national park will do. The Patterson Museum, which occupies an old locomotive factory, is hosting a new exhibit on the similarities between Patterson and Washington, D.C. It's all part of playing up the historical connection to Hamilton. What do you not have in the museum that you'd like to have? Oh, I would love to have the spirit of St. Louis in because the airplane engine was built here in Patterson. Unfortunately, I don't think the Smithsonian's going to let that go. Patterson has one of New Jersey's largest immigrant populations. Ironic, because Alexander Hamilton wrote the Alien and Sedition Acts. In 2017, it's that diversity that city leaders say will ultimately put Patterson on the map again for the right reasons. In Patterson, Andrew Schmertz, NJTV News.
great weather for the shore. David Cruz spoke to the editor of New Jersey Monthly, Ken Schlager, about what to expect when you go. So what makes her a good shore town? I mean, my favorite is Asbury Park, um, but it's mostly where I've always gone. Uh, what are some of the things that, that make a really good shore town? I think it's different things for different people. You know, it depends. Uh, you know, the families are looking for one thing. Uh, you know, young folks are looking for, for something else. Um, you know, great beaches, obviously, great access to the beaches, uh, interesting places to stay. Uh, um, some of the short towns have terrific restaurant scenes, dining scenes, and some of them just have, you know, funky clam bars. Um, some of them are real quiet places, with, uh, and that's what people are looking for. And some of them have big scene during the day, nightlife, and all this. Co the, the great thing about the Jersey Shore is that you can find all of that in different places. There's yeah. so, so much variety of So places. if you had to, to give a person a suggestion, one, you, you're a young millennial looking for uh, like kind of a party town, and then another one, you're a young millennial <laughs> or someone looking for a quieter town. What, what's the, the, a place to go if you really want to have an up Right. Well, Summer you know, day. Belmar and Seaside Heights, places like that, have always been considered kind of the party towns. The the really hot town right now is Asbury Park. Yeah. I mean, Asbury Park over the last 10 years or so has really come into its own. Uh, great restaurant scene. It always had the great rock and roll scene, and that's still there, which is really cool. You know, the Stone Pony is still there. Right. Wonder Bar is still there. But now there's all sorts of other things going on. Um, two of, of the recent openings uh, over the, the past year that have really made a difference there is there's. The Asbury Park has its first new hotel in years, the Asbury Hotel. Yeah, it's, sure. uh, it's a 110-room kind of boutique hotel. I, I think it's actually booked through the summer, but they've got these great public spaces, bars. There's a rooftop bar, which is really hot. And then there's also a rooftop bar at the other uh, kind of newish place that's really galvanizing the scene, which is the, uh, uh, there's a beer hall there, the Asbury, uh, the Gast Hall. And, um, and that, uh, you know, it's like, if you, if you know the, in Hoboken, yep. right, Pilsner House, this is a spinoff uh, from that. And it's, you know, really crowded, but, you know, great food, great beer selection, and a great scene. And Asbury has, it's more of a 12 months out of the year shore town. Right, absolutely. Because yeah. there's a lot of stuff happening there restaurant-wise and music, music venue-wise wise, that you do. Yeah. And, and shopping, you know, the, the Cookman Avenue yeah. area is really cool, galleries, antique shops, and all this kind of stuff. And so where's a good, quiet place to go? Is Cape May still the spot? Well, I wouldn't call Cape May quiet. It's a little bit more laid back than some of yeah. the party towns. It's right. my favorite place to go. And I'm amazed by how many people, particularly in northern Jersey, have never gone that far. It's you know, way egg, down Exit Eggs at zero. Yeah. But uh, it is a place that has something for everyone. I mean, there's so much there. There's so many different types of hotels, from a grand hotel like Congress Hall to you know more family-style hotels like uh, like the Montreal and uh, the Ocean Club, uh, beachfront hotels, really really nice, great restaurant scene, lots going on at night. Plus, you know, bicycling and birding, and, and there's a lot of history there, and just so much to do. I think for me, of all the shore towns, it's really the most beautiful, just pleasant to look at. Right. I didn't even mention the Victorians. You know, they've preserved yeah. all these Victorian buildings there. A lot of them are B&Bs that you can actually stay in or just, you know, walk around, ride around and, and look. And it, it's kind of like a, a living museum. You've got an app as well that kind of condenses all this information into a usable thing that if you want to make it down to the shore, you can just open this right. up. Tell it's me about that. Right. It's a free download, our Jersey Shore app. Uh, it's a free download. And wherever you are at the shore, it's location where. So if you want to look for um, restaurants, bars, anything like that, where to eat, you know, where to stay, all that's in there, and it'll show you the stuff that's nearest, nearest to you. What are, are, are some of the trends? I see a lot of times Asbury has this whole north uh, boardwalk section that's all food trucks. That's kind of an urban thing. Is that one of the trends in short towns? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, food, <laughs> food is food. a big thing in the show. Right, Everybody's right, right. got their favorite places to go for food, ice cream. We're now seeing more of these uh, kind of boutique sorbet type ice cream yeah. places opening up at the shore. Uh, interesting bakeries opening up in, in different shore towns and all different types of food experiences. Um, you know, beyond the, the kind of pizza and hot dogs, you know. Uh, uh, in fact, we have, we have a piece uh, in our June issue of New Jersey Monthly about healthy boardwalk food. Imagine that. Huh. So, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Shore Guide, New Jersey Monthly. Ken Schlager is the editor. Okay, thank you. Support for the business report provided by the Trenton Thunder, double A affiliate of the New York Yankees. Game and event information online at trentonthunder.com.
NJTV News how the state will modernize the grid to prepare for outages and disasters. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to NJTVNews.org. I'm Michael Hill. Thank you for watching. Have a great forum. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. My husband and I spent more than 30 years in the public schools. We're retired, but we like to stay involved.